Heavenly Father, we, again, just marvel at the work of your Son, who he is and what he achieved for us at the cross. The perfect lamb, the perfect sacrifice, finally the blood shed that a sinner would need to count on to remove your wrath, to satisfy your wrath, to remove our guilt from your sight. A sacrifice strong enough that the believer can stand on it and say, I believe, and you would, on the basis of that faith, declare that believer righteous. Thank you for his redeeming work. Open our eyes now that we might see our need for a redeemer even more. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. And let's take our Bibles and let's open them up to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, this morning, verses 9 to 20. The next major section in Romans, Lord willing, we'll finish today when we get to verse 20. And Paul's letter to the Romans is something like Paul guiding us down the gospel's path and then describing to us along the way various gospel truth features that we have to take in and understand. And so we're coming to the next end of the next segment of the gospel path. It continues on all the way through the book, but there's kind of a rest stop at verse 20, 19 and 20. And as we come to the rest stop at this point of the segment of the gospel path, it's actually a troubling place to be brought to. As we've said in the weeks past, the, the good news first preaches to us the bad news. The good news must first convince you of the bad news about you. And the gospel brings this charge against all mankind, that we are under sin. Verse 9, we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. And that's a difficult destination to arrive at, but it is the essential destination to arrive at for the good of your own soul. Because you cannot be saved by the gospel unless and until you arrive at this place that the gospel brings you to with its bad news. And what is this place along the gospel path like? Well, the primary characteristic of it is, is silence. Look at chapter 3, verse 19. So that every mouth may be closed. And all the world, nobody on that path with a mouth open, all the world accountable to God. You see, it's not a noisy or a contentious place at this point in the gospel path. And that makes it very much unlike the path that we've been on just prior to this place. The gospel's bad news about us, it gets protests frequently, doesn't it? In fact, Romans chapter 2, all the way through chapter 3, verse 8, protests are breaking out alongside the path as we go down it. Exemptions are claimed. Exceptions are thrown out. And as the noose keeps tightening along the way, inventions of evil come out against God and rocks get thrown at the gospel and rocks get thrown at the messenger of the gospel. Protests along the way make the path very noisy. But as you're going to see today, if you are to be saved by the gospel, you must be brought to this place in verse 19. You must be brought to the place where you offer no more excuses. Where you claim no more exemptions from the charge of sin against you. You must be brought to the place where you are no longer contentious or antagonistic against the charge of the gospel against you. 
There are no more protests at this point on the gospel path. The gospel must bring you to a point where it actually closes your mouth that has been full of protests. And listen, the gospel knows what it is doing. God knows what he is doing. The gospel must bring you to this judgment bar of God with its charge of sin against you and leave you standing there silent and trembling and guilty before God. It doesn't matter if you're the thief on the cross and you got moments to live. You must be brought to this judgment bar and made silent. It doesn't matter if you're a Christian kid growing up in a Christian home surrounded by Christian pets. You must be brought to this bar trembling with fear and silence. It doesn't matter if you are an axe murderer. It doesn't matter if you're the Pope. It doesn't matter if you're the President of the United States. The gospel will only save you with its good news when you have been made silent in agreement with its charge of sin against you. Let me read verses 9 to 20 for you. Paul says, what then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths. And the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. So that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for through law comes the knowledge of sin. Maybe this is a new or fresh way to assess yourself before God this morning. Have you been brought to silence by the gospel concerning its charge of sin against you? Are you done protesting that charge? Are you through claiming to be exempt from it? Are you done throwing rocks at the gospel and those who've been trying to share the gospel with you? How noisy is your heart and your mind when you hear the gospel's charge against you that you are under sin? Have you been humbled into silence by the gospel? Because the gospel has helped you to truly see who you are before God. And there's no more point in disputing what you know to be true against you. Listen, when you reach that point, you are ready and you are prepared by the gospel to receive the good news of faith and faith alone in Jesus Christ. This is not a new charge that Paul makes today against all mankind but what Paul is doing is he is gathering up the whole bad news into one final, great, sweeping statement against us all. And it comes to us in the form of three verdicts against us all. And that is what this passage is all about. Three undeniable verdicts prevent anyone from exempting himself from the charge of being under sin. Here's the first verdict. And it might be surprising. The sinfulness of mankind includes even believers. That's the first verdict. Look at verse 9. It's important for us to pay very close attention to the details in verse 9 and the context. Paul says, what then? That, that's Paul's way of saying, well, what could be said to wrap this whole argument up? In chapter 2, we talked about a Jewish hypocritical moralist who couldn't, in chapter 2, claim exemption from the charge of sin 
What we found out up to this point is Jew and Gentile, according to the gospel, were on equal footing before that charge. And the Jew would have been the, the quickest to claim an exemption because of his wrong view of the privileges that he had as a Jew. Surely, he thought, wrongly so, surely the Jew couldn't be as bad as the Gentile world. That's the way they thought, and Paul dismantled that whole thinking. So what then? And notice carefully what Paul answers. He says, are we better than they? And we need to decide who the we are that he includes himself with. And the best answer is found in the verse right above it. And why not say in verse 8, as Paul did, as we are slanderously reported and as some claim that we say, let us do evil that good may come. The we there is Paul and other gospel preachers, believers in the gospel who preach the gospel. They were slanderously reported as preaching in the gospel a command to sin so that good could come. So the we of verse 9 then is still that very same group, preachers of the gospel, believers in Jesus Christ. And the they then, are we better than they? That would then be those outside of believers, the, the Jew who has not yet believed, the Gentile who has not yet believed, the ones who are all under the charge of sin. So what is Paul saying then in, in verse 9? What can be concluded from all that the gospel has charged against mankind? That we preachers of the gospel, that we believers in Christ, that we are better than they? I mean, the Jews have no exemption, exemption, do we? When Paul says, are we better than they, he, he, that means, do we put ourselves forward with an excuse do we put before ourselves a shield and try to shield ourselves against this charge of being under sin? The Jews thought of themselves as better. The gospel says they are not. Well, are we believers better off by nature than the rest? Not even the preachers of the gospel can shield themselves with an exemption from the charge of sin against all man. Verse 9 for we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. The world in Paul's day could be divided up into two kinds of people, those within the Jewish nation from a Jewish perspective, and then everybody in Greek culture in the Roman Empire. And Paul says all are under sin, including the Jews who might believe and preach the gospel like Paul, he would be one of those, and including Greeks who preach, who believe the gospel and preach the gospel like a Titus in the New Testament. All are under sin. And that phrase, under sin, is a devastating condition. Sin is personified as a tyrant or as an emperor. We are all under the empire of sin. We, we are all under everything that goes with sin. We are under its deception we are under its tyrannical guilt. We are under its tyrannical condemnation. We're under its tyrannical power, its tyrannical doom. It is upon us. It is weighing down on us, and we cannot break free from its grip on us. And again, Paul's point on the gospel path here is to not allow any segment of humanity out from underneath this to conclude that their exemption from it is legitimate. The Jews were a people with many religious privileges and they tried to see themselves as exempt from the charge of being under sin. And if anybody should be able to identify with that and beware of that, it would be believers. It would be the church, even gospel preachers. What privileges we have. What benefits our children are being raised in. And under, religious people tend to be the ones to think that they're better off than the rest. What then? Are we churchgoers and gospel believers and gospel preachers with any better defense against the charge of being under sin? Not at all. We're included 
we are incorporated into the mass of mankind that has already been charged by Paul with being under sin. You say, well, when did he make that charge? Romans 1, verses 18 to 32. He was thinking, the gospel was thinking of everyone when he made that charge. Listen, this is why the church can never stop preaching the sinfulness of sin to the church, to itself. Because religious privilege is a temptation all of the time to exemption. Religious privilege oftentimes, unfortunately, leads to security, not responsibility, like we said last week. To make his point, then Paul pulls together a patchwork of Old Testament scriptures from Psalms and from Isaiah. I love this. The gospel, that's what he's preaching here in Romans. The gospel, which is found in the Bible, drags the Bible out in front of us all to tell us the bad news about ourselves. Verse 10, as it is written in Psalm 14 and Psalm 53, there is none righteous, not even one. That reaches back to Romans 1.18. Paul said this already. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. There is an unrighteous, not even one. Verse 28 of chapter 1, God gave them over to a depraved mind. And the first thing on the list is we are being filled with all unrighteousness. There is none righteous, not even one. God goes out throughout humanity, and he's ready to count the ones who are righteous in his sight. He's ready to count the ones who have the right condition of life that's required by him, and God can't even get to one. Verse 11, there is none who understands. Still Psalm 14 and Psalm 53. This reaches back to 128. God gave them over to a depraved mind. Verse 31, we are therefore without understanding. God looks across Jew, Greek, barbarian, American. He's ready to count the ones who understand him as he must be understood, and God can't even get to one again. Verse 11, there is none who seeks for God. Still Psalm 14 and Psalm 53. I know Christians talk about people like they're seekers, but God never talks about anyone like they are a seeker. There is none who seeks for God. Why? Isn't it clear enough way back to Genesis 3 when Adam sinned against God, did he seek God out? He hid from him in the tall weeds. Because we have all, Romans 1, become haters of God, not seekers of God. We're all hiding in the weeds of our sin. Verse 12, all have turned aside. Still Psalm 14 and Psalm 53. Now God finds something, but he went from finding nobody to finding everybody. He looked across all of humanity for the ones who have deviated from the path that leads to him, and now he can't find one who has not turned aside. He ran out of fingers on this one. All have turned aside. This is universal apostasy. This harkens back to Romans 1.25, for they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. Romans 12 Together they have become useless, still Psalm 14 and Psalm 53. The Hebrew equivalent for the word useless in the Old Testament was for rotten or spoiled milk. The Greek mind used it for rotten fruit. God's God's observation is that all of us together collectively are a rotten fruit basket. Rotted spiritually and we have therefore become useless. I mean, isn't that true in Romans 1.32? I mean, we know that those who practice such things are worthy of death. They not only do the same, but we also give hearty approval to those who practice them. And we just cheer each other on in our rottenness, our uselessness. Verse 12, there is none who does good. There is not even one. Still Psalm 14 and Psalm 53. This reaches back to 128 
where we're given over to a depraved mind and we're filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, full of murder, strife, deceit, malice. We are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. There is nothing good about us in that. According to God's word, God looks out upon all of mankind to see who is marked by the goodness that he defines as good and he does not even get to one. And now in verse 13, Paul pulls together some other scriptures to make the charge of being under sin even clearer to us and he turns to our anatomy to do so. Throat, and tongue, lips, mouth, feet, and eyes are mentioned Verse 13, their throat is an open grave. This is Psalm 5. What a vivid description. The scent of death is wafting up and out of our throats. Our throats stand open, ready to receive a dead body like an open grave does. The throat is ready to swallow alive a victim. Well, how? Who, who will it get? How will it happen? You need bait, and that's what the tongue is for. Verse 13, with their tongues they keep deceiving. That's Psalm 5 as well. The tongue comes out of the throat and it entices its victim with words of deception, of flattery, of lies, luring the victim closer and closer to death. And then in verse 13, the poison of asps, of a snake, is under their lips. That's Psalm 140. Like a snake's poison incapacitates its victim so it can drag it and eat it. So do our lies. We get the victim close enough to the grave with our lies and then we poison them with our lips. And, and, and you know we're talking, it's talking metaphorically here, right? Our words, our conversation is what in view, is in view. Our organs of speech reveal that we are actually killers in conversation. Verse 14 whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. That's Psalm 10. What comes out of our mouths is the, the worst that we could possibly hope for our victim. We, we, we want to curse upon them, and inner hostility toward them comes out. It's bitterness. It lurches out of our mouths for them. Now, verses 13 and 14 about the throat and the tongue, the lips and the mouth, that reaches back to Romans 1, I think, in verse 29. The throat is an open grave. We are full of murder. The tongue keeps deceiving. Verse 29, 29 of chapter 1, we are full of deceit. Poisonous lips and mouth full of cursing and bitterness. That's verses 29 and 30 of chapter 1. We are full of envy, malice. We are gossips. We are slanderers. Paul has made this case before. And Paul now moves from our heads all the way down to our feet. Verse 15. Their feet, verse 15, are swift to shed blood. This is Isaiah 59. Our feet carry our whole person. So this is a charge against the total direction of life that we're headed in. We're not a people who are quick to heal one another, quick to make peace, but quick to shed blood. And thus our feet show themselves then to be in alignment with our throats. Our throats are an open grave and our feet shed blood. We're in agreement with death and murder from head to toe. All of this reaches back to Romans 1.29 that we are full of murder. What does God find? What does Scripture find down the path that these murderous feet have trod? Romans 3.16, destruction and misery are in their paths. Destruction means to be crushed. It means to be shattered to pieces. That's what we do to each other when we get into one another's path. And we make each other miserable. We, we leave a trail of pain and despair and wails of ministry in our relationships. What a bloody trail we leave. And therefore, we wouldn't know where to find the path of peace if it was in front of us. And the path of peace they have not known. And the last description from Scripture is probably the one that is the cause of all the other sins above it. Verse 18 we're back to the head and the eyes. There is no fear of God before their eyes. 
Psalm 36. Our eyes are not on the right one. We've fixed our gaze upon ourselves. Our eyes are upon others in order to do them harm. What does it mean to fear God? I liked this definition I found this week. It's having such a due sense of his majesty, holiness, justice, and goodness, such that would make me thoroughly fearful to offend him. To have such a sense of his majesty, such a sense of his holiness and his justice and his goodness that would make me thoroughly fearful to offend him. If that kind of fear of God is not in the sight of mankind, then the guardrails are down, the the moral fences are gone, and man races off-road into realms of wickedness unknown. Now, verses 13 to 18 show from Scripture that we are devastated by sin from our head to our toe and back to our head. It's total depravity. Every arena of life, every area of life of an individual's life is corrupted by sin. The person is devastated, is totaled by sin. And verses 10 to 12 show total depravity in another way. The entire human race is totaled, personally totaled, all of us together totaled by sin. And Paul began by saying that not Even the gospel believer, not even the gospel preacher can put himself forward with an excuse or an exemption used like a shield against that charge. Because even believers like Paul and believers like the Romans who have great privilege, they come from the same seedbed of corrupt humanity. That's us. The first verdict which prevents anyone from exempting himself from the charge of being under sin is the sinfulness of mankind includes even us. We can't claim an exemption as the church. The second verdict, which prevents anyone from exempting himself from the charge of being under sin, is built off of this one. It's an expansion of the first one. Number two, the second verdict is this. The voice of Scripture incarcerates every protester. The voice of Scripture incarcerates every protester. Now, Paul transitions in verse 19, his argument from what those Scriptures said specifically about us to the bigger point that the Scriptures were after in saying those specifics. Verse 19, look at it. For we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth, did he say anything about a mouth? Yeah, he's been talking about a mouth, may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Now, we have to do some very careful work here again, like we had to do in verse 9. Paul is still addressing believers, which is evidenced by his use of we again. And we all, as believers, we know something. What do we know? We know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. Well, he says there's been some speaking going on, some sayings. Well, what has just been speaking? What has just been making its point through its speech? It's the scriptures from multiple psalms and from Isaiah. So then what does Paul mean by calling it the law? He's using the law here in its least restrictive way. Meaning it's, he's not talking about Mosaic law. He's using it in its broadest sense that it can be used and is used. He's referring to the Old Testament And it's not unusual for the New Testament to do that, to refer to the Old Testament scriptures as the law. Jesus did it in John chapter 10 when he calls Psalm 82 the law. And Paul does it in 1 Corinthians 14 when he calls Isaiah 28 the law. It's not a mistake to call those sections of Old Testament law. This is why as we go through Romans, we need to be super careful with what Paul means when he refers to law. And you might have to be careful when you see perhaps your translation capitalize L and they do that trying to make it appear to be mosaic law, a specific law. Let's keep going. We'll pay close attention to some other details and we'll pull it all together. So then we could translate it this way. Whatever the scriptures say, they speak to those who are 
under the scriptures. A better translation would have been within the scriptures, within the reach of the scriptures, the law. Paul will talk about what it means to be under the law in a formal sense in Romans 6, but that's not what he's thinking about right here. Here, Paul simply means that the Old Testament scriptures speak just like he let them speak in verses 10 to 18. And when they speak, they speak to those who are within the reach of those very Old Testament scriptures. So you know what we should do? We should back up into 10 to 18, and we should make an observation about whom those Old Testament scriptures were addressing. So look back at verse 10. They were speaking over all of humanity. All of humanity fell within the reach of those Old Testament scriptures. God's word spoke over all humanity and testified that it could not find one man amidst all of the humanity out there who was righteous, not one who understood God, not one who sought for God. God's word spoke over all of humanity and testified that every single one of them, all of them, had turned aside from God and that together they had become useless. The Old Testament scripture spoke over all of humanity and testified that not one was good. So who is within the law? Or meaning, who is within the reach of scriptures? The scriptures didn't see any man outside its reach, outside of its truth, outside of its voice as it spoke. So then what was the purpose for scripture speaking to all within reach of it? Verse 19, so that every mouth may be closed, shut tight, so that not one more antagonistic protest or claim of exemption could come forth from the gospel. Why did scripture speak to all within reach of it? Verse 19, so that all the world that's who scripture was just speaking to, all of the world, so that all of the world would become accountable to God. The scriptures in 310 spoke to the whole world so that all of the world would become guilty before God, subject to the punishment of God, become convicted before God, be incarcerated. The voice of scripture incarcerates every protester, silencing every mouth, of all of the world. Now we learned in chapter 3, verse 1, verse 2, that the oracles of God, the words of God, were entrusted to the Jews. That's true. But those oracles, the law in its broadest sense, the Old Testament scriptures were entrusted to the Jews so that all of the world might be spoken to by those scriptures from the Jews and so that the whole world would become silenced in their protest and become accountable to God. And this is where the gospel path must lead you and me. To this place of guilty silence before God. If you are not brought here if you are protesting, if your complaints or your claims of, of exemption are, are not brought to silence, the good news of the gospel will have no effect on you. And you will die in your sin. And you will have an eternity of noisy wailing and gnashing of teeth in hell. The voice of scripture incarcerates every protester, bringing them to silence, holding them accountable before God. But perhaps, perhaps there's still one who's not yet convinced that for one who is under sin, the way of moral rules is really all that bad. The, the way of adding moral rules isn't quite as bankrupt as Paul thought and said earlier. And that takes us to the final verdict that Paul Prevents and that prevents anyone from exempting himself from the charge of being under sin. Number three, works of law incriminate all flesh. This verse presents the transition in thought towards salvation that then gets picked up in 321 and following. 
And here is the wrong view of salvation, some might think in verse 20. Look at it. By the works of law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for through law comes the knowledge of sin. I left out, in my translation, I have the NAS, I left out the word the before law in both cases because it's not there in the original. And so what Paul means by that is not Mosaic law, and he doesn't even mean the Old Testament scriptures anymore. What he means when he just says law is the simple addition of moral regulations to a life, but to the life of, the, of one who is under the reign of sin, under sin. There's somebody who thinks, maybe I could just add rules to my life, and I'll find a way to get a, a legitimate exemption. If anyone in the world, if any man who is described by Scripture as Romans 3, 10 to 18 described him, adds to his under sin life moral rules, those moral regulations will tell him to get to work. You see, there are works of law. And Paul's news for that one is still very, very bad news. As one who is classified in verse 9, as one who is under sin, doing works of law will never lift that man out from the classification of under sin, and it will never put him into a new classification called righteousness. That's what justified means, to be declared with a status of righteousness. But simply adding works of any system of moral rules, a man under the classification of sinner will never lift himself into a new classification of righteousness. By works of law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. He remains under the classification of under sin. His flesh is just too weak to accomplish that. God's sight is just too holy and scrutinizing to allow that. Why can't the addition of works of law declare over him a new status called righteousness? Because... Adding law to your life doesn't bring a new classification. It only brings a new realization. Verse 20, for through law, through the addition of moral regulation, comes the knowledge of sin. Approach any man, any woman, any boy, any girl under the empire of sin in their life. Set before them a set of rules to do. Honey, don't touch that. What, is, what do they realize? I want to touch that. Boy, do they miss the mark. Do we rebel when the rules are set before us, when we are in an under sin condition? We do the very opposite. Don't look behind that door. Don't go there. Don't talk to that person. Don't text that person. Add Mosaic law as a system of rules to a Jew's life, one who is under sin, and Mosaic law will only reveal to the Jew a deeper realization of his own sin. Doing the works of that Mosaic law will never lift that Jew who is under sin out of the classification of that into a new classification of righteousness. There is no such thing as works righteousness. His flesh will fail him. Works of the law incriminate his flesh. Let's move into our setting, a Christian realm where we're at. Add Christian rules to a Christian kid's life, a kid who is still under the reign of sin. And the Christian rules will only reveal to him a deeper realization of his own sin. Doing the works of a Christian mom and dad in a rule system will never lift that kid out from the classification of under sin into a new classification of righteousness. His flesh will fail him. The work of that Christian law incriminates his flesh. No flesh, no flesh will be justified in God's sight this way. You see, the law or the Old Testament scriptures in verses 10 down through 18, they extend over your life and they speak into your life with the purpose of shutting your mouth down on every protest that's ever been there. 
The law or the Old Testament scriptures, they speak over your life to make you accountable to God. Because, verse 20, even if you try to add religious rules, a law, to your life, you will still be accountable as guilty before God. Because, verse 20, by works of law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for through law comes the knowledge of sin. Three undeniable verdicts. No one can deny these verdicts against us. The sinfulness of mankind includes even believers. The voice of Scripture incarcerates every protester and works of law incriminate all flesh. So where can you turn? Where can you turn if you've been brought to a place of silence before God? A a place of finally realizing you're guilty and that you are without excuse and that you do not have an exemption and that you indeed are accountable to God for your sinful life. Where do you turn if, if you don't want to protest anymore today? Where do you turn if you don't want to rely on your weak flesh with a new set of rules to try to just change your sinner status before God? Where do you turn? How do you get a new status of righteousness that God will accept but that you don't have? The answer is simple but profound. Is Jesus Christ. He is is your only hope. And the gospel that just closed your mouth is now ready to open your mouth so that you might confess with your mouth Jesus Christ as Lord and that you might believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Look at verse 21, a sneak peek of where we're going next. Now, in contrast, apart from law, apart from adding rules to your life, the righteousness of God that you desperately need but you don't have, the righteousness of God, apart from that, has been manifested, revealed. The Old Testament's been witnessing to this. What righteousness? Verse 22, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, for all those who believe. There is no distinction. There is the righteousness. Jesus Christ is the object of your faith, and through faith in him alone, a new status of righteousness comes to you. One that you could never earn with a set of rules around your life as one who is under sin, but simply crying out, with a new mouth that you believe comes a new status that you never had before. But what about all that sin of yours? There's a lot described there in verses 10 to 18. What does a holy and a righteous God do in response to all of your unrighteousness? I mean, does he just sweep it under the rug? Does he turn the other way and act now like he didn't see it? Have you ever done that as a dad, as a mom? You saw, you're just like, I cannot even deal with that right now. I'm just going to look the other way. Does God do that? May it never be. He can't do that. He won't do that. Jesus Christ is the focal point there as well. I want you to listen to me very carefully. In what way is Jesus Christ the focal point there as well? Just as through faith, God will give to you a status of righteousness that you did not have yourself, God at the cross put on Jesus a status of unrighteousness that he himself did not have. Is your status of unrighteousness. Just browse back at verse 10. Jesus Christ was the only man who was ever righteous before his father. Verse 11, he was the only one who ever understood the father and could explain him. <laughs> 
He is the only one who sought God the Father as God the Father should be sought out truly. Verse 12, even though he was tempted to turn aside from his father's plan for his life, he never turned aside to the right nor to the left. Jesus was the only one truly useful to God the Father and the only one who ever did good. Yet he is the very substitute who felt our unrighteousness on him, our stubbornness of mind upon him that refused to understand God. He felt our waywardness on him. All of us like sheep had turned astray and gone astray. Each of us turned to our own way, but God caused the iniquity of us all in that turning away to fall on him. All of our uselessness, our rotten spiritualness on him at the cross, all of our evil upon him. And God poured out his wrath on his son in your place at the cross. And Jesus was silent like a lamb before its shears is silent. No complaint came from him. There was no antagonism. There was no protest as he died in the place of unrighteous sinners like me and you. He wore on himself at the cross the status under sin that was mine. And God crushed him. At one point on the cross, he tried to unite his throat and his tongue and his lips and his mouth to cry out to his father, but God would not listen because his throat had become an open grave, because our sin was upon him. And God closed his ears to the cries of his son on the cross. And what are feet that were Swift to shed blood, what about them? They were finally nailed down in judgment when Christ was nailed to the cross. He was seen as, he was treated as one swift to shed blood, the very one whose blood was shed for the unrighteous, like you and me. What destruction and misery was in his path because of you and me. And what lack of peace he experienced on the cross as his holy fellowship with his holy father was broken. The only one who truly ever feared offending his father squinted through the blood streaming through his eyes, looking for any signs of his father who was deeply offended, but he could not see him because God had turned away and crushed him, offended by what his son was on the cross. See, he became sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in him on the basis of faith and faith alone. You see, we are, we are justified. We're justified as a gift by his grace, verse 24, chapter three, through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. God displayed him publicly as a propitiation, as a wrath-removing, wrath-satisfying death. He displays that righteousness through faith and faith alone. You can display the righteousness of God today through faith in Jesus Christ. Has the gospel closed your mouth of all of its protests only to open your mouth now and confess Jesus as Lord? Will you pray with me? What a mighty Savior you are, Lord Jesus. Thank you for shedding your blood at the cross. Thank you for enduring the unspeakable horrors of my sin upon you, of our sin upon you. Father, if there is one today who has finally been brought to the silence that your gospel would long to bring them to, in Romans 3, 
Open their mouths now. Give them a new mouth that would declare faith in Jesus, profess faith in Jesus, recognizing fully as much as they can recognize that they are guilty before you and that there is nothing they can do to merit your favor, but there is only one thing you require, and it is faith in your son, Jesus. Thank you for his death in the place of sinners like us. Thank you for closing our mouths that they might only be opened once again to believe you, to trust you, to worship you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.